Let's look at a story together. It's found in Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. And you probably thought, wait a minute, what's the sermon title for today? ISAB. By the way, that word is in the King James Version. It's only in the Bible one time. It's just not at the verses we're going to be at right now. Okay? So that's what I'm saying. You guys are overthinking too much. You've got to enjoy this, this Bible. It's just wonderful stuff. Okay. So... Uh, Mark chapter 8, picking up with verse 22. And he cometh to Bethesda. I should wait a minute. When you have it, you say amen, right? Okay. Mark 8, 22. And when he cometh to Bethesda, and they bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town, And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he asked him if he saw aught or, you know, what are you seeing? And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. How many of you have read this story before? I'm just curious. Have you ever come to this point in the story and said, why didn't it work? Why didn't Jesus fully heal? You know, it's amazing how many questions we can ponder about. Verse 25, after that, he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up. And he was restored and saw every man clearly. And he sent him away to his house saying, Neither do go unto the town nor tell it to any, anything in the town. I often wonder this. You know, a great miracles happened and Jesus said, Don't go tell anybody. Uh, I have to believe that Jesus knew the times and the place and the season of the events that were to come. Jesus knew prophecy better than any of us because he taught the prophets of old himself, right? So the time wasn't right for the fulfillment of the promises in Isaiah that he would even heal the blind or the lepers. That's why the time finally came that was close to when would be his death and resurrection. He told that leper, go, tell. You see what I'm saying? This wasn't the time. It was too early in his ministry. But still, the point still stands, why didn't he fully heal him first time? I can't help but think that we all, every one of us, are healed differently. The reason we're healed differently is because of our minds. Of our minds. God knew I needed a constant reminder in my life to lose my peripheral vision. I needed to stay focused. That's just the way it is. I needed a constant reminder. This man, what, does, does anybody pick up on something I think un, un, quite unusual? Is that when he touched him the second time, did you notice what the man did next? The detail is very important here. What did he do next? He looked up. Where did he look before? Since you gave that answer, I'm just curious. Did you? He looked at men. And I want to say, praise the Lord that even that was fuzzy. I've said it before and I'll say it again. My parents left this church when I was, or just before I was born, because they started looking at people. And they said, my goodness, what a bunch of hypocrites. 
we can get wrapped up and look at the black dot and not realize there's a whole lot of white up there. Right? So I can't, I, I got to tell you what happened this morning about 430 This is a show and tell. This is my first attempt at a black dot. Can anybody see? Maybe only you can see this. Do you know why I stopped? Why did I stop? Do you see? I ran out of white out. No, that wasn't it. I'm going to see if anybody's... Oh, no, wait a minute, I heard it. What? I have a line there. Yeah, I have a little line there, and I thought, that ain't going to work. I had to start over again. The, what I was doing, I had this on the counter, and I'm doing... You know how you going in an arch, you know, when you're filling in, and so I'm thinking I need to keep doing this to, so my arch would be right, you know, as I'm filling in? Y'all with me? Y'all are excellent coloring people right, right? So, so I'm turning the paper, and while I'm doing that, my pen hits it. Okay? Oh, horrible. I have to start over again. I woke up early this morning to do this. God spoke to me. He, he shouted to me, really. He said, you got to put the pen down. Now, what he was telling me was that as the paper moves and I reposition things, I should not be having my pen in my hand. Okay? I tell you what, it was such a profound thing, I had to struggle with this. Because every time I started on the second one, I realized the pen is still in my i got to put my pen down. So, one thing at a time. That's right. This was so profound, I realized... This is the same th struggle we have in our own lives. We are so determined to do things our way, we don't want to turn loose of the pen. Even how to reveal what we want others to see. It's fascinating. We forget there's a whole lot of white there's a whole lot of purity. There's a whole lot of love. There's a whole lot of the character of God we've been called to help others focus on because we all have a tendency to look at and see only the blackness. We're really quick to use this sucker. Really quick. Don't, don't feel bad about it. Adam and Eve taught us well. It's her fault. It's his fault. And Adam even came to the point saying, it's your fault, God. You created her. Lightning. My point is, we've got to learn to put the pen down. The dot is bad enough. Yes, It was still love. He's still patient because he, he took the time to explain to them the plan of salvation and he sacrificed that lamb, made clothes for them. So, for those that are anticipating, thank you, anticipating where you would expect this sermon to go, turn with me to Revelation chapter 3. And my prayer is that you're set up to hear a section of Scripture differently today. I'm assuming, no, I'm not. I apologize for that. I truly believe that everyone sitting here knows you are a part of the last remnant group of people. It's time to go home, right? And our calling is a high calling. And our issue, because we've all got the same issue, we focus on the dot way too much. And we forget what we've been called to focus on. 
So, a little trivia just to make sure you're with me on certain things. What does the number seven represent in Scripture? I've heard two answers. This is the reason why I'm asking the question. It means completeness. Number seven does not mean perfection. The word perfection is reserved for them. Okay? Completeness can also include a complete indwelling of him, right? I got tickled. Becky did a presentation years ago. It was on the spiritual gifts, right? And they had the cards up here saying all the different spiritual gifts. The fruits of the Spirit. Thank you. And the last one. How many of you happen to know the very last fruit of the Spirit that's listed? Yes, what's the last Self-control. Oh my goodness, we could have went all day without bringing up that subject. But apparently, that's the true settling in to His fruits that we want in us. Self-control means I'm not going to defend self. I only want to defend Him and His fruits. Amen? So, here we've got a message to seven churches. And this is to be a revelation of Jesus Christ. Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. Okay. Here is seven messages to his people that whatever issue, even self-control, we can claim victory over because of what he has done. You don't mind me speaking a little slower this morning because I want these points to be clear. The victory we are claiming is His victory. That victory is what is reproduced in us. So you have seven churches that is described seven characteristics of issues. I know your problems. I know your faults. I know everything about you. But I've got a good news message for you. There is victory even over whatever you want to think up or have thought of. Amen? So here is, we consider Revelation to be to us historically here in chapter 3 to the Laodicean church. We think of that historically, but we could also think of it as like the icing on the cake for the list of seven. Does that make sense? Just like the spiritual... I started to say it again, wrong. The, the, the fruits of the Spirit. I get them mixed up every time. Okay, so let's pick up here. Revelation 3, picking up with verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of Laodicea and write, These things write, these things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of creation of God. I mean, he's the faithful witness that that revealed victory over Satan not just can be done, but has been done at the cross. Not only the, the event in the wilderness, but also at the cross because he was resurrected again. I know thy works. So he's speaking to us. I know thy works. That thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou was cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now, I don't, I, I don't like this idea, do you? Uh, and we could debate. I've heard sermons both ways, discussions both ways. Which is the good, the cold or the hot? I don't want to be either one if he doesn't like, you know. But the point of it is, he's okay for you to be either one of the other. I made this comment at prayer meeting, and I'll say it again tonight. Have you ever considered a study on a particular word in Scripture? It's the, the word is the wicked. The wicked in Scripture are those that know the truth and deny the power thereof.
That's the wicked. See, there's a whole other realm of people that are called, uh, well, scripturally, the heathen. They don't know anything about God. It's those that know about God, but then turn away or choose not to follow. That's who's called wicked. And he knows he's speaking to a group that knows God and saying, so here's a new term, you're lukewarm. I'm going to raise my, I know I'm in desperate need of a Savior every day. Okay? So I know that this is speaking to me. And verse 17. Because thou sayest, I am enriched and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and blind and, and poor and blind and naked. I'm glad this passage doesn't end here. I've said this many times about Scripture. He never leaves us hanging. You know, he doesn't tell you where you're wrong. I don't, I don't ever feel condemned because Jesus said himself, I came not to condemn the world. He didn't do that. And so he, since he didn't come to condemn, that means he's always ready, willing, and able to counsel of whatever issue is in, in between our ears. There's a way of escape. Amen? So here, I counsel thee. I counsel thee that thou mayest be apparently that excuse me almost i counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire hmm. a character a true character let me have to say it this way the true character that has been tried in the fire of this world as a human that character that thou mayest be now truly rich truly rich that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see this is my challenge and I'm, my prayer is that you're hearing the same challenge this is life. It's all of our lives. And we have a choice every day to look at the dot or praise the Lord for all the white. True, complete, full victory is to have this eye salve every day to only see the white. I want it every day. Place on me the eye salve to see just you. And I, I don't know if it's a problem anymore. I'm kind of enjoying it. All I see in the church are trees. You know I love you. But I don't have good eyesight. Becky still rides in the passenger seat. But she's a lot of help. I don't know how many physicians there are here, but you know, if you're sitting in the optometrist's office and you see the letters on the wall, I'm one of those that for years they said, What's the smallest letter you can see? And I say, M A D E I N J A P A N. <laughs> Made in Japan, you know, that littlest line on the very bottom? And they're looking for that. You know, of course, there's not it's not even there, but I, you know, I'm one of those. But the point is, I've gone through the time where I didn't know there was a wall. There's an can you not see the E? No. I've gone through that. And to have what. I want to say what little I have of human sight, I praise the Lord for.
I guess it would have been closer to come up this side. I forget there are steps over here. I have a plaque on our, our wall at home that's like this one. Had some friends come over the other day, and they said they wanted one like that. If they could define it, found one. Nancy, Mark. Uh, it says, drop the stone. At the bottom of it, it says, drop the stone. It says, John 8, 7. Does anybody know what that story is referring to? The woman caught in adultery. It's time for us to drop the stone, drop the pen, drop whatever we are doing in our world to keep the black dot getting bigger, spreading. Drop the pen. Don't make those little marks out in places they don't need to be at all. It's time to drop the stones of accusations. It's time to ask for this I salve every day. I can't help but think that... Um, okay. A little story here. My next door neighbor, I'm looking forward to give a Bible study to. I hope she'll accept it. Okay? Every time that I have engaged my neighbor... Um, you can tell that there is a worldly life that you're engaging with. And she had some family there, and the story came up of, of something that had upset her, and I was just prompted to say, I love you. She was discouraged. And I just said, I love you. And a family member that's standing there beside her says, well, where's your wife? <laughs> I said, you, you don't realize what's going on here. She looked at me like, well, what, you know, what do you mean? I said, I'm a local pastor, and I'm just wanting her to know that God loves her. And that's all there is to it. Oh, 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 I'm so sorry. I said, you don't have to apologize. You just didn't know. I said, I'm seeing your sister being discouraged about something, and I just want to know that she's loved. And by the way, she, my wife is driving up with her sister right now, so if you want to meet her. So anyway, the point is we don't know we of our own self can't know the right words to say to others. People take things wrong. We are so geared to look at the black dot, we forget that there is good. You know? And it's difficult nowadays to, to do that without a fear. This is a fear. This is a fear that we have, and we're ashamed to even admit it. We're, we have a fear of what people are going to respond to us. We can say, hello, how are you today? What did I do wrong? <laughs> you know what I mean? Did I, did I pull in front of you or something? You know, they, they just naturally think they've done something wrong for you to respond to them, even if it's a first contact, especially. What are you getting in my space for? Yeah, Becky, you, okay. I was at work one day, and I was getting my grocery list to come home with, and with a room full of supervisors. And uh, when I hung up the phone, I said goodbye, honey. I threw her a kiss, hung up the phone, and one guy says, "You are so henpicked." I said, "Yeah, but I'm a happy rooster." <laughs> An evangelist that's passed away, Bill Liversidge, a lot of you in this room know him, and he told stories. But this is one that impacted my life that day for how Jesus indwells us. And we don't even realize the power we have mm. in us if we just let him be him. <laughs> Amen. 
So he says he's in Palm Springs where he lives and he's going to go to a restaurant and eat. And he's walking down the sidewalk and he's watching a lady with a Walmart buggy full of her life dancing in her tutu, several tutus, colorful, big hair, big painted on lipstick, just out of line and all over her face. And she's skipping behind her card and she's just happy. And Bill is watching as she's coming his direction. As he's walking, he's seeing people talk about her, and laugh about her and point at her as she dances by with all of her life inside her buggy. And as she's getting closer to Bill, God impresses Bill. Give her the money that's in your pocket. And he went, but you just gave it to me. <laughs> and he says, I know that. And God told him, I'm able to replace that money. I want you to give all the money that's in your pocket to this lady. And he says, but Lord, there are so many other people you could have called upon. He said, but I'm calling upon you. Now give her all the money that's in your pocket. So as she's getting closer to him, he just walks up to her and he hands her the money and says, the Lord told me to give you this. She looks at him, she smiles and I believe and she throws her arms around him and this total stranger kisses Bill Liversidge right on the mouth. <laughs> now in this day we live in, that means a lot. With lipstick everywhere. And as she is kissing Bill, you know, he's trying to draw away. And God says to Bill, she's not kissing you. She's kissing me. Father, what a privilege it is to be here now in this age of history, to be a part of a church family, that a movement is taking place, has taken place from just head knowledge of your love to moving it from the head to the heart. It's so exciting to witness people taking a stand for ministry, taking a stand to commit to helping the young people with a, a better walk of focusing on you and not this world. All of these people that have made a commitment to be in ministry, thank you. May your spirit just multiply and multiply as you illume in our in our eyes, our mouth, our hearts, as you use each and every one of us to share you with this world, just may you be glorified in all. Anoint us afresh with your spirit every morning. Wipe that eye salve, that healing eye salve on each and every one of us. May we only see you is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen.